I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, chapter 15. 2 Samuel 15. If you didn't bring a Bible today, you should be able to find a pew Bible in the racks in front of you or maybe on the pew beside you. And 2 Samuel 15 can be found on page 266 in most of those Bibles. So 2 Samuel 15 or page 266 in the Pew Bibles. Last week, we saw the repentance of King David in the wake of his own adulterous and murderous sin, David humbly acknowledged in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. Thankfully, the prophet Nathan assured David that, quote, the Lord has put away your sin. And then we learn from Psalm 51, that great parallel to 2 Samuel 12, that it was because of the Lord's character of mercy and his character of loving kindness that makes this complete forgiveness possible. The Lord offers total forgiveness to all those, but to only those who repent of their sin and believe in Him. So eternal forgiveness is real. It's something that God offers freely by His grace. But that eternal forgiveness did not mean for David that there would not be temporal consequences for his sin. That's true of David back then, that's true of us today. And you might remember that we also heard in 2 Samuel chapter 12 these sobering words to David. Listen to them carefully. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Well, chapters 13 through 21 of 2 Samuel, which hopefully you took some time to read this past week. Chapters 13 through 21 of 2 Samuel tell the sad story of sin's chaotic consequences in David's life. And here are just some of the initial lowlights of those chapters. David's son Amnon sexually violated David's daughter his own sister, Tamar. And then, another one of David's son, Absalom, took justice into his own hands and orchestrated the murder of the rapist, Amnon. Well, this act of revenge led to the banishment of Absalom to a faraway land. Finally, by the end of chapter 14, Absalom had returned to Jerusalem and was reunited with his father, King David. So at this point in the narrative, the end of chapter 14, we might wonder if the sorrow of sin's consequences have finally ceased. Well, let's listen to 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, to see if that's the case. Listen, follow along as I read from God's Word. 2 Samuel 15, verse 1. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, 
Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now did you notice where Absalom was hanging out in verse 2? Absalom was hanging out in the gate. Now this is an important detail of this story that we must not miss. You see, the gate in the ancient world was not only the place of entry into a city, it was also the place of judgment. So the gate in the ancient world is like the courtroom of our time. You know, like a contemporary judge hands down a sentence from his bench, the ancient king would make judicial rulings in the gate. Because you see, in the ancient world, the king was not only a ruler, the king was also the judge. He had executive duties, and he had judicial duties. The king governed, and the king adjudicated. And this judicial duty was to be carried out by the king and only the king or his designated official. Well, here in chapter 15, King David is not in the gate. Now, the text doesn't tell us why, so we ought not speculate. Instead, let's focus on what the text does tell us. The text does tell us that David's son, Absalom, is in the gate. And Absalom admits, in the text I just read, that King David has not designated someone to judge in his place. So Absalom takes it upon himself to judge like the king. All this to say, there is an imposter in the gate. Absalom is posing as the king. And in so doing, he is stealing the hearts of the people. Stealing the hearts of the people who ought to belong to the rightful king, David. There's an imposter in the gate. Some of you, like me, are completely fascinated by the true story of Anna Sorokin. You know that story popularized by the Netflix original, Inventing Anna. If you're not familiar, Russian-born Anna Sorokin posed as a fictitious German heiress named Anna Delvey from 2013 to 2017. And her act as an imposter was so believable that she gained access to the upper echelons of New York society, particularly the worlds of art. And she even duped Wall Street investment bankers in her great con act. Now, over the course of her multi-year con, she stole the hearts of many, making friends and establishing business partners with her flamboyant, personality, and her impeccable style. But she didn't steal only hearts. Along the way, she stole hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of goods and services and cold, hard cash. Anna was a scheming imposter, a particularly good scheming imposter just like Absalom. You see, Absalom knew exactly what he was doing when he rode into the gate in Jerusalem on his shiny new chariot pulled behind his fine thoroughbred horses, following an entourage of 50 men. He was scheming. 
And his scheme was positively evil. He figured that if he could steal the hearts of the people, he would not have to merely pose as king. He might actually be king. So after his successful four-year stint as the imposter in the gate, listen to what Absalom did next as we pick up in verses 7 through 10. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived at Geshur and Aram, saying, If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. Did you catch that? He lied to his own father in order to orchestrate a coup. Having established relationships with people from all over Israel while he sat as an imposter in the gate, he was now ready to use that relational capital to dethrone his own father, David. And in the pages that follow, we see Absalom's conspiracy play out in all its wicked detail. With Absalom's new military alliance established, David is soon forced to, to flee from the capital, Jerusalem. And then, when Absalom enters Jerusalem, he not only takes his father's throne, he also takes his father's concubines to bed, just as the prophet Nathan had predicted. It's all positively evil. And by the end of chapter 16, we're left to wonder if the schemes of Absalom, the imposter, would prove ultimately successful. I mean, would King David ever be restored to his throne? Well, to answer these questions, we have to fast forward. Fast forward to chapter 18, if you want to turn there with me. And there we will find the account of a father and son battle. David's men, under the direction of General Joab, meet Absalom and his men, the Israelite army. And they meet in the forest of Ephraim to settle this matter once and for all. So picking up in verse 9 of chapter 18, we hear the account, the account from the front lines of fight. And here is how things went down. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak. And he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. And a certain man saw it and told Joab, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man who told him, What? You saw him? Why then did not you strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, Even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you, and Abishai and Ittai, for my sake, protect the young man Absalom. On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there is nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. Joab said, I will not waste time like this with you. And he took three javelins in his hand and he thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. 
And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then Joab blew the trumpet, and the troops came back from pursuing Israel, for Joab restrained them. And they took Absalom and threw him into a great pit in the forest and raised over him a very great heap of stones. Remember Anna, Sorokin, Delvey, that scheming New York imposter? Well, her scheming ways finally caught up with her in 2017 when she was arrested in a sting operation and imprisoned. And though she was actually recently released, Anna now spends her days in 24-hour home confinement with no access to social media. She had quite a run, but eventually her scheming, imposterous ways caught up with her, and she had to face the judicial system. And the same was true for Absalom, that scheming imposter in the gate. You see, Absalom was not merely killed on the battlefield that day. And this was no ordinary military casualty. What I want us to see is that Absalom had an unexpected encounter with the justice of God in the forest of Ephraim that day. And we know this, we can see this because of the unique details of Absalom's death. These details were first pointed out to me about 15 years ago now, hard to believe, by a seminary professor of mine, a pastor and scholar named Dr. Gordon Hugenberg. So while it was the, the javelins of Joab and the swords of his armor bearers that ultimately killed Absalom, we must not miss the event that made this execution possible. Now, if you've been reading along with me in 2 Samuel, you know back in chapter 14 that Absalom had a big head of hair. I figure he was like Fabio of that day. Remember Fabio? What happened to him? Well, Absalom had this big head of hair. And he only cut his hair once a year. And as it turns out, Absalom should have visited the barber before this battle. Maybe it would have saved his life. But probably not. Because as you heard, while Absalom was riding through the forest of Ephraim, his thick head of hair got caught in the thick branches of a great oak. And he was suspended between heaven and earth, just dangling there, hanging from the tree. Well, this may sound like nothing more than an accident or a, or a foolish tactical error by Absalom, but it is not. Absalom hanging from that great oak is a subtle but unmistakable evidence of the justice of God. That's because any Israelite who knows his Torah knows that Deuteronomy 21, verse 23 says, A hanged man is cursed by God. A hanged man is cursed by God. Absalom encountered the justice of God that day in the forest of Ephraim. And so if you can picture in your mind's eye him flailing about, hanging from that big oak, you are meant to see an unrepentant sinner cursed by the justice of God. And if his hanging wasn't enough, notice that his burial is rather excessive. Joab... And his company of men didn't merely throw Absalom into a shallow grave on the battlefield. No, they took the time to toss his dead corpse in a pit and then, quote, to raise over him a very great heap of stones. 
Dr. Hugenberger suggests that this purposeful burial under a large pile of stones is meant to depict a stoning, which was a common method of death penalty for criminals in the Old Covenant. Yet another sign of God's justice and his curse upon unrepentant sinners. What I want us to see is that Absalom, the scheming imposter, could not escape the justice of God. And his dramatic death is a sober reminder to all who live in unrepentant sin that as Numbers 32, 22 famously says, be sure your sin will find you out. You can run, but you cannot hide from the justice of God. So how did David respond to this news of his son's death? Well, listen to chapter 18, starting in verse 33. Chapter 18, verse 33. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's obvious, isn't it? David's initial response is one of absolute sorrow and grief which is to be expected at the loss of his child, even his adult child. You can see the sorrow in David's tear-filled eyes. You can hear the grief in his voice and the repetition, my son, my son. No one, no one wants to outlive his children. But I have to imagine that this is more than lament for the physical death of David's son. David is grieving the spiritual death, the eternal judgment of his own son. Because David knows that Absalom's life was not marked by faith in the Lord, but rather rebellion against him. And David knows that while Absalom is morally culpable for his own evil behavior, Absalom's death is just one more consequence of David's earlier rebellion. So no wonder David says, would I had died instead of you. You know, this example of David's grief, it reminds us that we ought to weep at the thought of unrepentant loved ones experiencing the judgment of God. We ought to weep. And at the same time, we must also remember that justice must be, must be served and that God's justice is always perfect. So where does this justice of God lead us here in 2 Samuel? Chapter 18, following. Well, after David's initial sorrow and grief have subsided, we hear this in chapter 19, verse 8. Look there with me. Chapter 19, verse 8. Then the king arose and took his seat in the gate. And the people were all told, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. And all the people came before the king. See, at the close of this tragic episode, David, the rightful king, is back in the gate. The king of God's choosing. That king anointed as a shepherd boy by Samuel so long ago. That king who is a man after God's own heart. Not because he's perfect, but because he's repentant. 
The repentant king is in the gate where he belongs with the people of God coming before him again. So we ask the question of the sermon series again. Who will be king? Who will be king in the gate? David will be king in the gate. And with David on the throne once again, we're reminded of that forever covenant made with David by the Lord back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That was when the Lord promised to establish David's throne forever. You see, no one can knock David off the throne. Not Saul, not Ishbosheth, not Absalom. And that means that no one can knock the house of David off the throne. Which means that the ultimate son of David, Jesus, is seated on the throne above. That throne which we sang about earlier this morning. Make no mistake, whatever this world, with all of its scheming imposters, will tell you, Jesus is the rightful king in the gate. He's seated on his throne in the gate this morning and forevermore. And that means, as the Bible teaches and the Apostles' Creed affirms, Jesus will, quote, come again to judge the living and the dead. That is to say, Jesus will return to pour out the perfect justice of God on all those who have not bowed their knee to him in faith-filled allegiance. So Jesus' kingship, it really does serve as a warning today to any of you who are living in unrepentant unbelief. It's a warning. But the kingship of Jesus is not only a word of warning, it's also the proclamation of good news. The greatest news, in fact. We're about to come to the king's table set before us this morning. It's a table set with bread and cup. And these elements are a call to remember. That was Jesus' command, right? Remember. Do this in remembrance of me. And so the bread and the cup bid us to remember his death on that tree. Where Jesus endured the curse of God for us. You know, unlike Absalom, who hung from the branches of the great oak because of his own sin, Jesus hung from the tree of Calvary for the sin of others, namely for the sin of people like me and you. Galatians 3.13 puts it this way, Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Hear me out. Jesus is the king who took the curse. And that's why the Apostle Paul boldly proclaims in Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the glorious good news. You can't add to or take away from the death of Jesus on the tree at Calvary. No deeds of merit, no acts of self-punishment are necessary or required because the death of Jesus has already completely satisfied the just wrath of God. Let me say that again. No deeds of merit or acts of self-punishment are necessary or required because the death of Jesus has already completely satisfied the just wrath of God. This is the good news. King Jesus was condemned so that we would not 
receive condemnation. So brothers and sisters, remember this today. Remember this every day. Jesus is the rightful king in the gate. The king who graciously endured the judgment of God on the tree of Calvary that we might be forgiven by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come to this table, we come to the table of your Son, King Jesus, and we turn our eyes on him by faith, trusting in his substitutionary atoning death. By taking this bread, by drinking this cup, we proclaim our trust in Christ alone. And we pray this all in his name. Amen.